ông quỳ chụp ông chụp được cả một tô khi chụp lá cá để tiếp thị sản lá cá hấp lau được cá chun từ mít tươi bây giờ có phế nó bay lang từ sợi sơn thanh nó bọc luôn Thank you, Mr. President. May the be copy some of the documents that you can make your own. I will begin with the most fundamental issue: the understanding democratic Kampuchea. An issue that Kampuchea has particularly emphasized above all, and that is the existential threat. In their brief, the co-prosecutors try to portray some racist referring to his so-called hatred and contempt for Vietnam. They spin. DK resistance to Vietnam's continuous illegal attacks as DK encroachment on Vietnamese territory. They ridiculously suggest in their brief that democratic Kampuchea decided Vietnam by negotiating simply in order to quote-unquote gain time to prepare forces for further aggression later. Ultimately, the co-prosecutors paint the CPK as the paranoid and irrational instigator of armed conflict with them. As they put it in their brief, and I quote, Pol Pot and his circle acted under the delusion that they faced an imminent danger of domination from Vietnam. And in contrast, the co-prosecutors portray Vietnam as a peaceful, patient, respondent. And according to them, Vietnam was quote, extremely careful not to provoke the DK regime. Unquote, and pursued a cautious and conciliatory policy uh, to lower tensions in the country by moving from the left to negotiate. Mr. President, this is such a dumb and predictable argument. As Lisovana already, Lisovana already described the very first way in which the Manichaean narrative was formed was through Vietnamese propaganda to try to legitimize Vietnam's blatantly illegal invasion of the UK. But clearly, that propaganda was successful. 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 The chamber also called Vietnam a country that the CPK quote considered arrival and threat insofar as it supported sought to extend its own communist interests in Cambodia. Mr. President, as we have set out in our book, I will summarize here nothing. Nothing could be farther, further from the truth. Vietnam was an imperialist aggressor, blaming and simply but a proxy of the Soviet Union. And according to a man who died 
three weeks ago today um, Zbik New Brzezinski the former US national security advisor he called Vietnam not a proxy of the Soviet Union Soviet Union which would invade Afghanistan only one year later in which invaded Czechoslovakia uh, only ten years earlier the proof that Vietnam was an imperialist aggressor is not only the fact that they brutally invaded and occupied Cambodia for more than a decade, but in all the other actions they took along the way, as I will discuss. And yet, their colonial designs for Cambodia have been ignorantly whitewashed by this government. In just a way, Vietnam would have hoped. Now, of course, the co-prosecutors dismissed the threat of Vietnam as a CPK delusion. But unfortunately for them, the CPK were by no means the only people to identify that threat, that existential threat. The late King Father Norodom Sihanouk was always very vocal In 1963 already, he said that no Vietnamese leader would Quote, sleep peacefully until he has succeeded in pushing Cambodia towards annihilation, having made its first go through the stages of slavery and of course. The late King Father Sihanouk echoed his message in countless meetings and documents throughout his lifetime. I refer you to a brief. For, for, for example, in letters he sent to the Vietnamese Prime Minister Thom 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 Dong, he said that Vietnam's invasion of DK was, quote, unquote, colonization undertaken, not out of altruistic motives, but in the spirit dominating and the co-prosecutors also ignore that as all Cambodians in this courtroom and presumably also outside this courtroom surely agree that Vietnam has had ambitions for Cambodia for at least a thousand years and which have been fulfilled over centuries. For example, Vietnam has annexed Cambodian territory, including Champa and Campuchia And it continues to covet territories throughout Southeast Asia, for instance, in the South China Sea. Now, Mr. President, the modern version of Vietnam's Imperialist ambitions under Vietnam's foremost leaders, including Ho Chi Minh, Nguyen Yap, and Le Don, was to establish an Indo-Chinese and this Indo-Chinese Federation would merge Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos into an economically and politically integrated state within which Cambodia and Laos would have served as a slave state. I'm paraphrasing the late King Father here. There is clear evidence that throughout the decade, Vietnam completely sought to establish that Indo-Chinese Federation. For example, in 1972, Vietnam's leader said that, quote, sooner or later, Campuchia will be with Vietnam. The Khmers do not have another way out. End of quote. The factors from the Indo-Chinese Federation 
ហើយបើទោះពេលជាអ្វីដែលសព្វព្រះអាទិត្យបានលើកឡើងដែលសោតទៅកម្មវិធីជាតិ Vietnam មិនមានចំណាត់អារម្មណ៍លើសត្វភាពនោះឡើយគេប្រើប្រាស់ even the New York Times didn't buy reporting that Vietnam may be planning to make an empire of the region. And of course, they were right. The Omphan Company was the biggest trading company in the world. The Omphan Company was the biggest trading company in the world. The Omphan Company was the biggest trading company in the world. The Omphan Company was the biggest trading company in the world. The Omphan Company was the biggest trading company in the world. The Omphan Company was the biggest ពន្តែជាក្សដៃប៉ះពន្ធមិនកម្ពុជាវិត្រេតត្រូវបានមិនពាក់របស់ខ្លួនបត់ជាញឹកញាប់ណាស់នីវ៉ាន់ជីហា
ສາພອນນັ້ນດູຈັດຕາມປະຕິບັດຂອງພວກເຂົາສາພອນນັ້ນດູຈັດໃນຕໍາບານບັງກາດ in addition for 1954, many Cambodian communists were The co-prosecutors claim in their brief that when the so-called Khmer Vietnamese returned to Cambodia, they were wrongly regarded as internal enemies. But the truth is, the truth is that they were groomed to eventually become Vietnam's internal collaborators. For instance, after their return from Hanoi, many became liaison officers between CPK and Vietnam who reported to Vietnam rather than to their fellow Cambodians. Maybe I should step away for a moment, for my brief as well, because it just, just struck, struck me that right now um, in, in Washington, D.C., there's a big upheaval over mere contacts between members of the Trump administration and Russians. Seems that they don't talk about anything else. Of course, The same situation would apply here. If you're talking directly to your enemy, that is something of very grave concern. Back to my brief, uh, Mr. President. Ultimately, and as uh, Nguyen Chia has said correctly, from uh, 1960 to 1970, Vietnam employed every trick available to destroy the revolution of the Khmer people and the development of Cambodia. The key tricks they used were deceptive negotiation tactics and manipulation of public opinion. For instance, in 1967, Vietnam announced that it would respect the Brevier Line border with Cambodia, which already favored Vietnam. And in May 1976, however, it reneged on that promise. Why? As its chief negotiator later revealed, because Vietnam had learned that there might be petroleum deposits in that part of the sea. And Vietnam, of course, wanted to go. Let me give you another example. In February 1978, Vietnam proposed terms to end the war and yet another example of Vietnam's deception was that Vietnam frequently made completely unfounded complaints of alleged decay incursions into Cambodian territory just before it planned to invade decay. This apparently has convinced the co-prosecutors who tried to present the armed conflict as entirely decay-provoked. Mr. President, it is natural, logical, that when a country is so violent as it was, its policies will be defined by the threat to its security. Is this the case in the world today? And you are listless, of course, to the case during democratic Cambodia. And documents on the case files show that the extension of threat of Vietnam was understandably at the top of the CPK's policy-making consideration. And of course, it goes without saying that this threat was a driving force behind CPK's defense and security policy. However, the same is true 
of the CPK's establishment which also focused on the need to develop national capacity to ensure the case survival. Ultimately, the CPK stressed the need for democratic Cambodia to maintain its independence and to strengthen its ability to resist enemies. There's nothing strange about this. มันมีอะไรเจอเรื่องกันหลายๆที่ผมต้องนอนเล่นเล่นเล่นเล่นเล่นเล่นเล่นเล่นเล่นเล่นเล่นเล่นเล่นเล่นเล่นเล่นเล
ដែលស្ក្រាប់ហៅវៀតណាមវូត្រីអ៊ីមទីហៅវៀតណាមទីហៅវៀតណាមទីហៅវៀតណាមទីហៅវៀតណាមទីហៅវៀតណាមទីហ
in our brief of crocodile. We try to make this double strategy conceptually easier to understand by calling Vietnam's internal collaborators plan um, the primary plan, plan A. And we refer to Vietnam's external efforts to what we call Plan B. Now, having already described Plan B in the past, the next part of my presentation now, Mr. President, will focus on presenting Plan A, which, of course, is the lesser known of Vietnam's two strategies.